Welcome to CS4510. Uh, the topic of today is going to be uh, piece-based completeness. L17B. The topic of today. So we've talked very thoroughly about NP completeness, right? Uh, let's talk about piece-based completeness. What is piece-based again? Piece-based is the class of languages decidable uh, by an algorithm which uses no more than polynomial space. It's actually pretty big. So we have, you know, we know P is a subset of NP. We very much do not know if that containment is strict or not. And we can actually prove that NP is a subset of P space. Give me two proofs that P, NP is a subset of P space. There's two, there's at least two proofs, three proofs maybe, three proofs. Like, suppose for contradiction that it was not, then it would have to write down. When you show containments of classes, I don't know if many of the proofs are in contradiction, usually because you just show direct simulation. Yeah? Can we not just do what we just did and do Space and P space. Uh, do you okay? So you say you say NP is a subset of NP space, which is equal to P space. That works. That's a fourth proof. NP space is a NP is a subset of P space because P is a subset of P space. NP space is a subset of N, NP is a subset of NP space because. Non-deterministic polynomial time machine can use no more than non-deterministic polynomial space. But we know those are the same, so there you go. That's a fourth proof. Um, here's another proof. Um, brute force search over the witnesses in polynomial space. Write one down, try it, ignore it. Write one down, try it, ignore it. Um, not only can you verify every, every algorithm that can be verified can be decided in exponential time by polynomial space. You can actually just do SAT. Give me a polynomial time algorithm for SAT. Excuse me, a polynomial, don't give me a polynomial time algorithm for SAT, give me a polynomial space algorithm for SAT. SAT is a, yeah. Write down an assignment for everything if that assignment doesn't work, up, like by one. Yes. Importantly is that, in fact, that uses linear space. Write down the assignment. If it didn't work, dang, erase it, try another one. That uses linear space. Actually, n plus log n, but that's O of n, right? Um, SAT is NP complete. So SAT is one problem which is an unelected representative of the entire class of problems in NP. Where you can put SAT, if you put it in a class that's closed under polynomial time reduction, so goes the rest of the class. You put SAT in P space, the rest of NP goes with it into P space, right? P space, you may be surprised to know, has its own complete problem called TQBF. TQBF, we'll talk about it very in detail today, but it's somewhat like a generalization of SAT. You could not put all of NP in linear space, though. No, because, because there's linear like space is not closed under polynomial time reduction. I see. I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, I'll leave it to you as an exercise. Proof that P space does not equal E, where E is linear exponent time uh, 2 to the O of n. EXP is time uh, 2 to the polynomial exponent. Right? Uh, EXP is the polynomial time closure of E. E, uh, turns out, is not equal to p-space. Um, hint, we can prove kind of by that argument that p-space does not equal E, but we don't know which one is bigger, ironically. So the proof that, you, that any of you could be, should be able to do is that p-space does not equal e. You can prove that p-space does not equal e without proving which one is bigger. So such a thing could be done. It's not, it's not a, too difficult of an exercise. But let me stop myself before I get off, get off track. Right. So we proved SAT was NP-complete. And what that meant was that SAT was a language that was in NP and that for all L, in NP, there was a polynomial time reduction from L to SAT. So if a problem is a deterministic verifier or a non-deterministic polynomial time Turing machine, 
that problem could be mapped to a specific instance of SAT. SAT being one problem represented this entire class of problems, many diverse things, clique, knapsack, subset sum, whatever. Super Mario is not uh, NP hard, um, Sudoku. Um, and we wrote down Boolean formula like this, right? X or Y or Z, right? Now, when we wrote down a formula like this, we, they, we said they don't have free variables. No, we said they had free variables, right? But actually, when we put them in the set sat, the set that is in sat, those that are in sat actually don't have free variables. There is secretly a hidden quantifier that we've not written down when we've written sat like this. And I'll just put a not here just to make things interesting. When we say a formula is satisfiable, it's satisfiable if there exists a satisfying assignment. So what we've actually done this whole time, and not we, this is not technically true what I'm saying, but there was an invisible quantifier that we just never wrote down. There exists x, there exists y, there exists c, such that x or y or not c, right? By the fact that sat is existentially quantified by the definition of sat, we took Boolean formula with no quantifiers, and then by putting them in sat, we existentially quantified over them. We just didn't write the quantifier. This formula is satisfiable if there exists a satisfying assignment. But it turns out that if we write the quantifiers like this, then the next question you should may, may have is, well, I know of another kind of quantifier, the universal quantifier. What happens if we allow ourselves to universally quantify over uh, universal quantifiers? So consider for all x, for all y, exists c x or y or let's see, right? Consider quantified Boolean formula that allowed us to, to replace some of those existential ones with universal ones. That's all TQBF is. TQBF is simply the generalization of SAT that allows universal quantification over its variables. Now, a formula must be true if it isn't. Let me give you the formal definition of TQBF. It's true quantified Boolean formula. So what it means is it's an encoded Boolean formula of Q1, X1, da, 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 Qn, Xn, uh, phi on X1 to Xn, such that uh, whatever this thing is, is true. I'm not going to repeat the notation on that one. But it's formula that are, every variable is quantified over. It's either a universal or a uh, Qi is equal to either the existential quantifier or the universal quantifier. So that's just E. Right? Each variable is either universally or existentially quantified over, and uh, the formula is true. Right? Let me give you an example of, and, and of course, this internal one, phi, is a CNF. Sorry, kind of a tedious definition. I'm kind of being all over the place with that. Phi is a CNF universally and existentially quantified over. Right? Now, important, did you guys know that quantifiers do not permute? We knew that? Everyone knew that? Okay. In 2016, I failed my AI exam because I assumed they permuted. And I've held that grudge uh, forever because no one told me, or at least when they told me I wasn't paying attention, that quantifiers don't permute. So I'm making sure everyone knows very loudly that quantifiers, uh, in general, if you, you cannot alternate the quantification even for the same letter because you get a different statement. Consider the following two uh, ones. Let's say for all x, um, there exists y, such that x or y, and not x or not y. Right? Then consider, uh, let's just permute the quantifiers but not the letters. For, for there exists an x, there exists a y such that for all x, x or y, and not x or not y. Right. These are two different TQBFs. These are both, well, actually, they may not be TQBFs, they're definitely QBFs, right? Let's determine if they're true or not. The first one says, for all x, there is a y. So let's consider every possible x. Now, x is a Boolean. Let's consider every possible x if there is a y. Um, if x is 0, is there a y? y could be 1 here. If x is 0, then this is true. y is 1. Okay. Now, if x is 1, this is going to be 1. So choose, this is going to be 0. So choose y to be 0. 
So if y is 0, choose, x, choose y to be the opposite of it, whatever x is. So for every x, you can always choose a y. Now, that's the way it's read. For all x, there exists a y. The existence of y is dependent upon x. And in fact, for each y, each x, there may be a different y. But simply for every x, there is some y, right? Basic stuff. This one is true, right? This one is an element of CQPF. Let's think about the second one. Is the second one true? Why not? Doesn't matter what y you pick, there's an x that makes it false. Let's try, let's try y equals 0. If, is it true for y equals 0? It can only be y equals 0, 1. If it's y equals 0, is it true for all x? If you try y equals 0, you could choose x to be 0. So it's not true for all x. Okay, fine. Try y equals 1. If y equals 1, this is going to be a 0, so you, need, you could choose x to be 1 as well. So it's also not true for all x. So this one is actually not an element of TQBF. Not only do quantifiers not necessarily permute, but the permutation of the quantifiers definitely affects the truth value of the statement, right? Maybe something everyone else knew except me. Um, right. Any questions on TQBF, the syntax and the form of it? Why it's a generalization? Certainly, if your quantifiers are all existential, exists, 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 you just have a SAT formula, right? So a subproblem of this is just SAT. But this is not obviously something that's different than SAT. Like, how do we know that TQBF itself is not NP-complete? That's, we don't have a proof that TQBF is not NP-complete because that would prove NP does not equal P-space, which, which is an open problem, I recall. So we don't, we don't think it's NP-complete, but we don't know how to prove it. We're pretty sure it's not. But we want to prove that TQBF is NP-complete, right? Excuse me, we want to prove TQBF TQBF is P space complete. What this means, what are the two, if you had to guess, what are the two things that, that make something P space complete? Question? Oh, okay, yeah, let's hear it. TQBF must be a representative from P space. Under what definition of reduction? Correct. Now, you may have a question. Wow, that hasn't happened in a minute. You may have a question. Why are we using a polynomial time reduction with respect to p-space? Why not using a polynomial space reduction? We talked about p versus np with a polynomial time reduction. Why are we talking about polynomial space with a polynomial time reduction? The, def the, the answer is you want to use a definition of, re of reduction that is much, much weaker than the problems in that class, so that the reduction cannot accidentally solve something. For example, P, all of P is P complete under polynomial time reduction. Every problem is polynomial time reducible to every other problem in P. Po the polynomial definition of polynomial time does not help the definition of P. People study completeness within P using a much weaker notion of reduction called a logarithmic space reduction. A log space reduction is how they study complexity within P, P, very fine-grained stuff in there. You study the relationship between P and NP using a polynomial time reduction. And it turns out polynomial time is pretty reasonable of an algorithm for anything, right? So you can actually study polynomial space complexity with this polynomial time reduction. And again, there's like 13 different variants of reduction. Like, what if your reduction was allowed access to randomness? What if it was a truth table reduction? You know, all kinds of ancient, archaic, hyper-specific things. Polynomial time uh, reduction is a, great, is a great one. It's a great method of translation, right? Certainly because P space is bigger than NP, it's okay. It's like... You know, the polynomial space reduction, we could just reduce anything to anything, right? Yeah, all, all problems in P space first. would be P space complete under a polynomial space reduction. Reduce, the reduction would solve the problem in polynomial space and then map it to a single yes instance or a single no instance. Yeah. So that's not too helpful. We want a weak notion of reduction. Right. So TQBF, the proof is going to be similar to the cook levin theorem, except it won't be at all. It'll be the opposite of simple. Let's first prove that TQBF is in P space. How do you prove a problem to be in P space? Construct an algorithm to 
and solve it on the real space. Although we're talking about complexity, everything is still where did my notes go? Everything is still um, yeah, here we go. Everything is still about algorithms. So to show TQBF is in piece space, all you have to do is give an algorithm for it. Now, what kind of propose to me an algorithm to solve TQBF in polynomial space? By the way, TQBF, if it is P space complete, and we believe P, TQBF does not equal P, if, if we believe that P space does not equal P, you should not be able to construct a polynomial time algorithm. One of the interesting things in this complexity is like all these open questions, you should kind of know what the community, the theorists, people smarter than us, what they think the answer should be, and then use that as guiding, a guiding light towards how you perform constructions. So if it is true that P does not equal P space, and we're trying to prove TQBF is in P space, we should be able to give a polynomial space algorithm such that the algorithm is probably not polynomial time. So what should we try? What is a method we could try? Yeah. Uh, iterate over the quantifiers from left to right. And if you run into like a for all, check each one and make sure it's Check each one and make sure it's true. And if you run into one exists, check that it, at least one is true. But how are we? How are we going to check uh, both of them? Let's say the first quantifier is a for all quantifier. The way we're going to check both of them to be true is they end up going to be recursive. We're going to do basically the same thing with Savage's theorem. So here's the way I have the algorithm. It's quite wordy. A is going to take on input a TQBF, and I'm going to des de describe the syntax as Q1, X1, Qn, Xn, phi of X1 to Xn. Okay, lots of symbols. Okay. It takes as in phi, uh, A takes as input a quantified Boolean formula. Okay. If uh, n is equal to zero, just evaluate. If there are no quantifiers, then every variable has been plugged in, and it's either a one or a zero already. So just as our base case, just return, just and and or correctly, negate correctly, and then return if it's zero or one. If it's return, if, it, if you collapse it, you compute all the ands and ors, and you get a one, you return true. If you get a zero, you return false, right? Um, if, let's say, Q1 is equal to the for all quantifier, we're going to return. Notice that if uh, we can sort of unfold the TQBF and replace a quantifier with a logical or, and then each of those can be computed sequentially in polynomial space. So we're, we're, we're going to return A on input Q, the encoded of Q2, X2, Q N X N of phi with a one evaluated. We'll do a zero first. And A on input Q2, X2, Q N, X N by with a one evaluated. Okay. Importantly here is this logical and that we do. Hopefully it's not too confusing on the notation. We make two recursive calls on A. A is the entry point of our algorithm, right? We recursively do it by evaluating the, the, the uh, Boolean formula at 0 and at 1, right? This is the core part. There's a lot of baggage in the way, but that's the part that we do, right? Something is true if and only if uh, it's true for x0 and x1. X, x1 equals 0 and x1 equals 1. Right. The case, the other case is just done the same. If uh, q1 is equal to ex exists, it's going to be return a q2 x2 qn xn phi of 0 xn or a q2 
2, x2, qn, xn, 1, xn. If the first quantifier is an existential one, you break it up into an org, and you return if one of those recursive calls returns true. If uh, the first quantifier is a for all, you break it up into an and, and you return if both of those return true. Now, this is a recursive call, and because the same reason for Savage's theorem, recursive calls are run sequentially to reuse space. You're not going to use that much space in this, in this recursive algorithm. First of all, is it correct? Does this return correctly? Okay. Uh, what is the space complexity of this algorithm? Well, again, we're going to take uh, the recursion depth times the stack size, stack, stack frame size. What's the recursion depth here? Yeah, it's going to be n. What's the size of a stack frame? I'll tell you, you once you finish that recursion depth all the way down, it ends up being only a bit. You only need to return the bit if, if the base uh, was true or not. So the stack frames are going to only return up the stack a single bit if it was evaluated true or zero, right? So it's going to be uh, O of n space. So not only is this a polynomial space, it's a linear space algorithm. Right? Could you do a different polynomial space algorithm? Maybe. But this one I think is elegant. Right? And in fact, this construction will come up more often. This is the second time we've done a recursive divide and conquer on a space complexity problem. Right? Questions on this one? TQBF, harder to prove it's in P space than proving NP was in, proving SAT was in NP. Proving TQBF is in P space is harder than proving SAT was in NP. Right? Let's get on to the reduction. Now, the reduction is going to work similar to the Cook 11 reduction, except it's going to be done in also a creative way. The Cook 11 style reduction is going to fail for us. We want to prove that for all L in NP, excuse me, habits, all L in P space, that there's a polynomial, a polynomial time reduction from L to TQBF, such that W is an L if and only if um, some TQBF is an element of TQBF, right? Whatever that quantification system is, right? Whatever sequence of quantifiers it are. What we're going to do is start off with what we did with the Cook-Levin theorem, is that we will, uh, if, um, if L is in P-space, there is a deterministic Turing machine, D, to uh, decide if uh, W is an L, only using, let's say, S of N space, which is a polynomial. Let's call it S of N, but let's just say it's a polynomial, okay? S of N is some polynomial space. So what we'll do is create a formula such that D on W accepts if and only if, um, I'm being sloppy in this notation, for all, so some TQBF, of hard-coded with D and W is an element of TQBF. So we'll make a Boolean formula, a quantified Boolean for formula, evaluate to true if and only if the machine accepts. That's something too strange because we simply did that two days ago with the code <coughs> theorem, right? But that's what it'll mean for us to do. Unfortunately, we're not going to get as conceptually simple of a proof as the cook levin theorem. In fact, maybe we'll get a simpler proof if you like to think recursively. But we won't be able to apply a direct construction uh, as we did in the Cook 11 theorem. Any questions on what we're about to show before we do it? What we're trying to do? So let's try to let's tr try to repeat the construction of the Cook 11 theorem and see where that fails. The Cook 11 theorem, you recall, we constructed a table. 
French at tableau, and we converted that table into a formula, right? And then great, the, we said that because the table was polynomially sized, a polynomial time reduction was able to read the machine uh, description and write down such a formula. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a polynomial time, a non-deterministic polynomial time machine. We have a deterministic space machine, okay? So if we were to begin such a process, Q0, W1, so the initial configuration goes there, these are all filled in. This, the width of the table is going to be the space, right? The width of the table is going to be O of S of N. What is the height of this table going to be? 2 to the O of S of N. Okay, so what's the size of the table in all? Too big. Yeah, it's going to be S of N times 2 to the O of S of N. That's very sad. A, a polynomial time reduction cannot write down the hard-coded table that way. So we will have to think creatively. We should also expect this reduction to fail because such a reduction might accidentally imply that TQBF is P-space complete. TQBF, what's the difference between TQ, TQBF and SAT? TQBF has universal quantifiers. This doesn't use the universal quantifiers. We hopefully will have to make good use of the universal quantifiers in such a way that they cannot be immediately eliminated. If every TQBF formula could be translated into one that only has existential quantifiers, that would prove TQBF is NP complete. So hopefully those quantifiers get used in our construction. So what we'll do is we'll perform a, const uh, a recursive construction similar to that we did of Savage's theorem. Again, Savage's theorem makes it, shows its head for the third time. Oh, my mic was not on. Hopefully that'll be fine. There's mics in this room as well. So what we're going to do is recursively define a uh, a um, TQBF formula. So before we do so, we're going to have to hard code a base case TQBF formula. Let um, we want to define some formula phi, ci, cj, uh, t, to be in TQBF if and only if uh, you can go from ci to cj in t steps, right? Let's do the base case first. Let's do phi of c1, comma c2, comma t, OK? What is the formula? Why does such a formula exist? Give me a formula such that the quantified Boolean formula is true if and only if uh, C1, excuse me, one step, C1 equals C2, or C1 yields C2 in exactly one step of the transition function. Why must such a, how would you tr try to construct such a formula? The same way that we did for Cook 11, like we just used the local area and verify that they were translated correctly. Yeah. Several comments we can make about this. Basically, what you're going to do is make a two by S of N table, and then you're going to do like a local something. It's going to just check if uh, C, uh, C1 is equal to C2, or if C1 yields C2 in one step of. Uh, of delta of uh, d, right? What is the size of this? In terms of, if we have a space bound of, f of s of n, what is the size of this thing? O of s of n. Ah, is it O of s of n? I'm so glad you brought this up. The Aurora Barak book, I, I, the, the Aurora Barak book claims a bound of the size of the formula of O of S of N. And then I gave this as an exercise to my students, so I go figure it out. Go work out the construction, OK? And not a single person was able to get an S of N space bound. And then I sat there and I looked at it, and I was like, actually, the best space bound I think we can get is S squared of N, OK? 
The reason for this is you need to check that no QI appears twice in the same row. Not just that the configurations are valid, because this you don't need to check in the Cook 11 because you have a, an, you have a base case and then an induction hypothesis. Here it's just i step, i plus one step. So you don't get that base case. You need to ensure something like that. You need to check something like that. And that takes n choose 2, s of n choose 2, which is going to be O of s of n squared. Now, I went through every single source and every single proof of the Cook Lev of the, not of the Cook Levin there, but of TQBF being piece basically complete to see what they said about it. And all of them say something about it's polynomial in S of n. So they don't say it's S of n. They don't say it's size S of n, but they say it's simply polynomial in n or it's polynomial in S of n. And if S of n is supposed to be a polynomial, that's fine either way. In fact, not a single book even constructed. That's another powerful thing. What you, this is why it's so important you understand conceptually the Cook-Levin theorem, so you don't actually have to ever do programming ever again. Theorists don't do programming. That's the programmer's job. All you get to say is, I could think I'm going to do the programming, and then not actually have to do it. The magic words you say are, by a construction similar to the proof in the Cook-Levin theorem, I could probably do this, but I'm not going to. I can estimate the size to be probably polynomial in n. Okay? The original paper said it's like polynomial in n. Many books say it's obviously polynomial in s of n. You know? It's definitely, I'm not 100% certain, I'm only 99% certain that it's not linear in S of n, because I can't find an explicit linear construction. Just a lot of words on, on this base case, okay, but it exists. Now we can define a, any questions on this base case, right? We convince Cook Levin works. Um, okay, let's do a, uh, let, how would we define uh, our Savage's theorem recursion with a quantifier? It's not too hard. We would simply say phi of ci comma cj t to be equal to there exists some c such that phi of ci comma c comma t over 2 and phi of c comma cj comma t over 2, right? Where exists c here, this is a sequence of encoded uh, Existential quantifiers, it's like exists C0, exists C1, right? Something like this. Some set of Booleans that encode the configuration. Convince yourself this is just Savage's theorem, okay? This is a recursive construction, and then we choose the D at the end to be whatever the space bound is we want, right? But D, we know T can be at most what? Every time we, what is the size of this formula? Let's take a second to estimate the size of the formula. Again, we're looking for a polynomial time reduction. This polynomial time reduction must write down a polynomial sized formula. Let's hope this formula is polynomial sized. What is the size of this formula? Every time we divide t by 2, what happens? Every time we divide t by 2, that formula doubles. Yes. This is some size. We divide t by 2. It's this and this. This is then going to double, and it's going to double, and it's going to double. Every time we divide t by 2, the formula doubles. So what's the size of the formula? T. T. What is T? Now, that is better than s of n times 2 to the o of s of n. But in the context of polynomial, no, it's not. That's still pretty bad. Notice that we have not used an existential quantifier, excuse me, a universal quantifier yet. But we have made a recursive formula. Now, we need to throw in a universal quantifier in there to figure out a way to, quote unquote, compress the formula. We're going to compress the formula so that a polynomial time algorithm can write it down. Here's the way we're going to compress it. That's an and. So we have this thing that exponentially blows up in its length. What you're going to do is exponentially fold it in on itself using an, a universal quantifier. This shows the power of quantifiers. A single quantifier is insane. A single quantifier is the power of all of non-determinism. What we're going to throw in there is a single quantifier, and it's going to fold the formula in half for us recursively, making sure it's not exponential blow up. It's not folding it in half one time. It folds it in half at every level. right? 
you, whenever you see an and, you should be thinking about multiplication, about universal quantification, right? So what we're going to do is um, exist. We're going to say that this is equivalent to exists C for all Z. Uh, Z is equal to the pair CI comma C or, or is it and? No. Or Z is equal to the pair C comma CJ. This implies uh, phi of Z comma T over 2. Now, that's an implication that's not in CNF form. I believe you could work it out, right? Not P or Q. You could redo the whole thing, and then you have something in CNF, OK? The unfolding of that doesn't take any, any space. But notice, we just looked at these pairs here, CIC and CCJ, and said for exists C for all Z, Z is either one of these two pairs, implies, that the, impl implies the recursive formula, OK? Are we convinced in the correctness? We were successfully able to use, we threw in this for all z here, and that folded it in half for us. Thank God. Recursively folded it in half for us. Now, what is the size of the formula? There is no longer, every time we divide t by 2, there is no longer an exponential blow up. The formula does not double every time we divide t by 2, but every time we divide t by 2, what do we get? How much does the formula increase by? Some constant amount. Let's say the base case is going to be of size poly and S of n, right? So it's going to be every time we divide t by 2, we add an amount, right? So it's going to be log t times something. But what is that something? Yeah. Which is going to be... Um, some polynomial in S of n. Now, if S of n is a polynomial, then this is polynomially sized. So there's our polynomial time reduction. The machine follows this construction. It, uh, using the transition function, it writes down such a formula. The satisfying assignment. Now, can we call it a satisfying assignment if it's universally quantified over? Sure. It's not like a witness now because it has to be true. Some of the bits have to be true for any possible value they take on. But um, this formula is in TQBF if and only if the machine accepts. And the answer provided to the machine would be an accepting computation history of it. Right? This is a correct uh, construction of a TQBF formula, such that it's true if and only if uh, the deterministic polynomial space decider accepts the W, which is true if and only if L was in P space. So we see that we've performed a correct reduction from L to TQBF for all L in P space. So therefore, TQBF is p-space complete. Right. Questions on that? You had to be able to expect that this universal quantifier would have to get used somewhere. Because if we just were able to do the construction without it, it would have just proved it would have been able to prove uh, NP equals p-space. And we don't know how to do that. So certainly, I'm not going to be able to prove that for you today, or ever. So universal quantifier is there. Let's throw it in. Let's add some power. That is sufficient for us to compress the formula significantly. Questions on this? All right, let me give you a, f uh, a final overview of space. We know a lot about space complexity now. Um, there's a reason no one has ever talked about space complexity to you, mostly because it doesn't matter. Usually, you're, people are trying to increase space in order to decrease time. So we have proven that TQBF is P space complete. And like how NP is NP, uh, how SAT is NP complete, there are a large family of problems which are P space complete as well. So if we put uh, P here, we put NP here. We can put P space here. Man.
We know P is a subset of NP, which is a subset of P space. The, end, the hardest NP complete problems include SAT, they include knapsack, but also things like Sudoku. Um, what are some other NP complete problems people know? Three coloring. What are some clique? P-space complete problems, a surprising amount of them are P-space complete. Uh, chess is P-space complete with polynomial bound. If you bound the depth of the number of moves, so generalized chess you play on an n by n board, we mentioned was XP time complete. But chess, if you bound the depth of the game, the number of moves a game is allowed to be, as a function of n, if you put a polynomial bound on the number of moves possible, chess is actually... Uh, P space complete. Uh, what else is P space complete? Checkers is P space complete. Go ends up being P space complete. We notice a pattern here is that uh, a lot of the NP complete, actually, by the way, TQBF is NP hard, but, may per, but not NP complete because we can't prove TQBF is in NP. But why is TQBF NP hard? it's P space hard and everything in NP is already in P space. So Correct. It's like trivially get it. Yeah. So we know that for all L uh, in uh, P space that there's a polynomial time reduction from L to, to TQBF. And we also know that for all L, and since NP is a subset of P space, we do know that um, for all L in NP, that there must be a polynomial time reduction from L to uh, TQBF. So trivially, TQBF is NP hard. But in fact, it's not NP complete. We actually think it's harder than NP complete, right? What, there's a second proof that this is true, though. Why, why is, give me another reason why TQBF is NP hard. Let's see if we can think of one. I don't, we, don't, we don't need to think of one, but let's see if we can think of one. You can map in polynomial time sat to TQBF. How do you do that? What's the reduction from sat to TQBF? Yeah? Add the exists at the start. Yeah, syntax. syntax. You've got to just throw a bunch of ex exists, exists, exists. So the subproblem of TQBF is actually NP complete. TQBF in general, probably not NP complete. We can't prove TQBF is in NP. We have no idea how to verify in polynomial time. Like, we proved it's P space in P space, and we proved it's P space hard. Let's try to argue why TQBF is probably not in NP. Like, what is a witness to the problem? You can, prove, you can provide a witness to SAT by simply saying what the answer is, and someone plugs and chugs. But how do you verify one answer when it's got universal quantifiers in there? You can't, essentially. You still have to go brute force search, check a bunch of stuff. And then it's exponential in the number of quantifiers, uh, none of universal quantifiers. So no, no it's not going to be verified efficiently, right? Um, right. P space probably does not equal NP. Um, but notice that a lot of the things in NP are those which are like puzzles. And the things that we didn't prove, and these pro these pro proving these reductions are a lot harder, I'll just say, just because it's a generalization of NP completeness. Proving these reductions to be NP complete, chess, checkers, and go, each of these could take you six weeks to learn. No, like three days. But each of these reductions is non-trivial. But each of these are uh, two-player games of perfect information. What's like an example of a two-player game of non-perfect information? Does anyone know? Starcraft. Starcraft? Okay. Um, that's def yeah, StarCraft, you, the map is shadowed. So that's definitely, by definition, non-perfect information. Give me some other games that are not perfect information. Give me a game of perfect information. Two-player game of perfect information. Yeah. Generalized tic-tac-toe would definitely be probably P-space complete. I would have to Google that. T 
Tic-tac-toe is unique because it's so simple. Maybe an n-dimensional n-player tic-tac-toe might be piece space complete, something like this. When you think about NP-completeness, with, with respect to the puzzles and finding a witness, it's kind of like um, NP is very much like puzzles, right? Sudoku, some Rubik's Cubes problems. When you have a sequence of universal quantifications like there, you should think of these like your moves, okay? You make a move, and then you make a move, and then you make a move, and then you make a move. Let's, let's say you're providing a witness to someone who, um, you're trying to prove to someone you know a solution to a Rubik's Cube. You show them a move, then you show them another move, and then you show them another move, and then you show them another move, right? Or Sudoku, you show them where to put the nine, and then where to put the six, and so on. Uh, P space is m more like games. So when you have, for example, exist for all, The way you should think about this is that the universal quantification, excuse me, the existential quantifications are your moves. And the universal quantification is for any move your opponent can uh, make. And then after your opponent makes a move, then you make another move. And because the quantifiers don't permute, that's why this order preserves. In fact, you can reduce TQBF not to simply those which have universal and um, existential quantification, but those that have exactly alternating universal and existential quantification. You can map any exists x1, exists x2, uh, to a formula that is exists. So let's say you have exists x1, exists x2, phi. You could do exists x, x is equal to x1, or x is equal to x2 implies phi, right? Something like this. So given two quantifiers that are the same, you can actually quote unquote compress them, right? If you have two quantifiers that do the same thing, you can always kind of replace that with some cost with a single quantification. So if you have exist, 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 that's just a single exist. If you have a sequence of moves, that's just the same as you making uh, one move, right? Actually, this is slightly off. This is wrong, right? Uh, yes. Should be like x1 comma x2, the pair, right? And then you break it up into whatever. So um, yeah, so alternating quantifiers are the only, only ones that matter. And we see it's very much like games. So here's the sort of final philosophical nail in the coffin about NP completeness, excuse me, P space completeness. If, um, if NP is harder, excuse me, if P space is bigger than NP, if NP does not equal P space, we can say that uh, games are harder than puzzles. That is something that is kind of a logical jump, but perhaps believable. NP complete problems, exponential time, but NP, P space bigger, uh, bigger class, harder, yet still exponential time, even if the algorithm runtimes are the same for them, uh, under this view, games are harder than puzzles. Now, when you actually go and measure the runtime of the algorithm of these, actually, we don't, it says the opposite. Often, in fact, we have some interesting dynamic programming and memoization tricks for true quantified Boolean formula. I think the best runtime of true qualified Boolean formula is like 2 to the 0 0.77n. The best algorithm for SAT is 2 to the n. So in fact, t algorithmically, TQBF is easier if you fix the number of quanti alternating quantifications. But it doesn't matter. P-space is bigger. QED. Any questions on P-space completeness? Excellent. I'll see you guys on Thursday.